We are now at part three of lecture 16 of Applied Machine Learning, where I would like to talk about some practical aspects of applying uh, unsupervised learning in practice. So we defined uh, our first unsupervised learning algorithm, and now I would like to uh, talk about some important considerations to be aware of when you're trying to use this in practice. Um, now, recall that we assumed uh, so far that our data set comes from a data distribution, uh, which is a distribution over uh, over X's, which are our inputs, there are vectors of attributes, and our data set is simply a collection of IED samples of uh, X's from this probability distribution. So when we talked about supervised learning, we defined this impo important concept called generalization, which means that after we have seen uh, data, after we have seen training data from our distribution, once we go and uh, deploy the model and we have new additional unseen data coming from the same distribution, then the algorithm will still perform well. It will be useful and it will give us some useful prediction. It will provide us with useful signal. Um, so this is the high level concept of generalization. It extends beyond just the training data. So I would like to uh, also talk about how, how this concept extends to unsupervised learning and we're not going to cover the entirety of the topic uh, in this video but uh, it will give a, it will give you a first uh, uh, a first taste of the issues that are involved in unsupervised learning compared to supervised learning so the concept of uh, generalization that I defined in uh, at the beginning of the course for supervised learning doesn't exactly extend to unsupervised learning because we don't have labels. We can no longer apply the same uh, notion of accuracy on training and test set that we have that we had defined earlier. Uh, but there is still a notion of, uh, of of generalization that is useful here. So we can think of this probability distribution as having two components: uh, a signal component which can represent a set of hidden clusters, or this can be human speech, or some low dimensional data space where the data lives. And then we have additional randomness, noise, that corrupts this signal. Uh, so for example, the clusters are not all small and, and, and tight, they're all, they're more spread out, there's randomness within the clusters, uh, the speech may be corrupted in, in, in white noise, uh, and the low dimensional data space, again, the points may be shifted slightly off from this low dimensional uh, data space uh, and they, they as a result live in a higher dimensional space and one way to think about generalization which is useful for both supervised and unsupervised learning is that a good model will learn the signal f but it will discard the noise e this error e it will only learn the the noise so this kind of intuition we can apply it to unsupervised learning to get a better understanding of when Super, when unsupervised learning works and when it doesn't work. Um, as, an, as a running example for this video, I'm going to use the following data set. So here I'm using a feature of scikit-learn called make blobs, and here it forms this data set, uh, which is two-dimensional, and uh, it actually has a certain kind of structure that I'll show you in a second, uh, but without any labels, it looks like this. Um, now, I also have true labels for this data set, and it actually corresponds to four clusters. There are actually four clusters in this data. So there's a cluster, there's a yellow cluster here, there's a green cluster here, there's a purple cluster here, and a blue cluster here. And uh, if we remove the labels, then we have this signal that we, then we have something which looks like a, like a uniform uh, set of data, but actually it has this structure hidden inside of it. Now, in unsupervised learning, we can think of something which looks a lot like underfitting. If we, uh, if we, um, or we, we observe something which looks a lot like underfitting, if we try to uh, fit a model that is too simple for this data. For example, let's run k-means on this toy data set, uh, and let's ask it to find two clusters. Uh, and we obtain from k-means the following two centroids, which are the red diamonds here. And although it does find two useful uh, sets of points, even visually inspecting this, we see that here in this region, there's more white space. So this set of points seems to be more distinct 
that um, from it seems to be distinct from this set of points. So it identifies useful structure, but it's still unsatisfying because it really it hasn't described it hasn't identified the entirety of the structure that's in this data. Uh, there's actually more richness, and we haven't really uh, found the, uh, the 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 entirety of the structure. And also, if we look at our objective here, it has this value, and I'll come back to this value. But here we have around 400. Uh, the value is around 462 for this particular uh, clustering. And uh, of course, to mitigate this problem, we can increase the number of clusters. So if we increase the number of clusters to four, we have something which looks like this, which actually recovers a lot of the structure that we have seen in this data. Uh, but we can keep going. Uh, oh, and also this improves our objective. It goes from 462 to 164. Uh, we can also keep going. We can add more clusters here. Here we have 10 clusters in the data. And we can keep going and get at 20 clusters to this data. And now our objective is really small. Um, but even though our, our objective is small, clearly this clustering at some point stops being very useful. Um, so it, it basically identifies a cluster here, identifies a cluster here, a cluster here. But we know how the data was generated. And actually, all of these yellow points, they're just samples from the same Gaussian distribution. And it just happens that here, there were in the middle in this white region, there were no samples. And so this looks like a separate cluster. These little points look like a cluster. These points look like a cluster. Uh, but now we're not really fitting the signal. Now we're fitting noise. And so in that sense, we are essentially overfitting the data. We have started to fit the noise rather than the signal. And even though this is not a very precise definition, it still feels a lot like overfitting. Um, and I, in, in, this, in these slides, I, I refer to it as, uh, as, as overfitting, even though overfitting is a concept that's mostly defined, it's mostly used for supervised learning. I just want to point out that this is another failure mode of unsupervised learning when we try to uh, when the signal that the model identifies now corresponds to the noise rather than the true signal that's in our data distribution. And of course, we can take this example to, to the extreme and we can fit this little cluster, this little cluster. There's a, there are a few points here that, uh, or I guess it has determined that this is a separate cluster here. Uh, these two points are a cluster, these two points are a cluster. But now with 50 clusters, it's clearly just fitting noise. And this is not useful, even though our k-means objective is very small. Um, now, unlike supervised learning, we don't really have labels for this. Of course, in this toy example, we do have labels. Uh, that's because I generated them. But in practice, we don't have labels. And so it is hard to... Uh, assess the quality of our, of our clustering in an objective way. But there are some heuristics that can be used. For example, one popular heuristic is something called the elbow method. Uh, and that's a general approach for tuning hyperparameters in, in unsupervised learning. And the idea of this method is that we plot the objective function that you saw earlier. So it was 462, then it was 164. We plot this value as a function of our hyperparameter, which in this case is k. And then we look at the curve, and we and we refer to as the elbow uh, to the point. We refer to the point in which there is an inflection in the rate of decrease of this curve as the elbow. So this loss will decrease, but at some point it will stop decreasing. Uh, uh, it, it will start decreasing more slowly after a certain point in the curve, which is called the elbow. And the elbow is something that is often a good guess for the hyperparameter of the model. So here, let's, let's, let's perform this exercise for the k-means model that we had earlier. Uh, so I'm going to uh, plot the objective value for different uh, values, which go from, uh, from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to, uh, to k here. And I'm going to assign a score to this data. Uh, and we see the following uh, pattern. So of course, everything is decreasing. But then after about four, this rate, it just, the curve flattens out and the line is almost, now we're, we're almost at a straight line here. So we're, we no longer see any incremental, well, we, 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 we decrease our, our objective function, but the rate of decrease has slowed down. The, the delta at each point now is roughly the same. So it seems like the, 
the rate of decrease has saturated after about k equals 4, which is the right number in our in this case because k equals 4 is the is the actual number of clusters in this data. And we refer to this red point, this point at 4, we refer to this as the elbow. Uh, it's called the elbow because you can think of this as being an arm and the arm is bent and the elbow, this is where it comes from. But um, this is the point where the utility of adding more clusters saturates and we just have a uniform decrease. So here we have, we, we, th this, is, this is one heuristic that can be used uh, in order to detect, uh, to, to detect this, this value. Uh, and more generally, uh, detecting these kinds of failure modes, again, I'm referring to them as overfitting and underfitting. This is, this is a definition that I chose uh, in practice. Uh, maybe the more general and the more correct term would be to just say that we're fitting noise or we're not fitting our signal. But I, I, I like to draw this analogy to uh, overfitting and underfitting in supervised learning, so I keep using these terms. Uh, and this is a problem that happens in supervised learning, but it's much more difficult to diagnose. And uh, it often requires our own intuition, it requires human evaluation to see whether uh, the results, the structure that has been found, whether it's useful or not. That is the case in many applications. Um, although in some applications of, supervised, of unsupervised learning, we can have access to a set of labels or we could manually go and we could try to label some of these data points. Perhaps we could inspect them. Uh, for example, if we're dealing with digits, we could go and manually label a few, a few digits and see if, this, if the structure that we have found is useful or not. Um, so there are, there's also a set of techniques for measuring the accuracy of a, of a, of a fit uh, based on uh, true labels. Uh, that can be used. But in general, this problem is much more difficult and uh, less well-defined than in supervised learning. Um, and finally, I, I want to add that uh, in general, this is true, but there are certain families of models which are in nature probabilistic, and we will be talking about probabilistic methods in unsupervised learning really soon. And there, we can actually have uh, a similar definition to overfitting and underfitting as we did in uh, supervised learning by looking at the likelihood of the data. So sim we, we had a definition of, uh, or we had this concept of optimizing log likelihood for uh, supervised learning. Um, we will also define the same idea for unsupervised learning. And this log likelihood objective is actually something that we're going to be able to use in order to uh, evaluate the quality of a fit on uh, training and held out data. Uh, and that, that is a third approach to understanding these two failure modes of unsupervised learning uh, that we're going to look at later. But for now, uh, I guess we have, with, with these kinds of uh, algorithms like k-means and others that we're going to see, uh, it requires either human intuition and inspection, or it requires creating a small label data set or obtaining labels and then using techniques which uh, assess quality using labels. And if we believe that we are uh, overfitting the noise in the data, then of course we have different solutions. Uh, the one that we have seen is to reduce the model complexity, for example, reducing k and k means. Or we could just have a single model uh, where we could penalize large values of k, so we could assign a cost for choosing a high k. Uh, if we have additional hyperparameters, we could just ass assess a cost for all of these hyperparameters uh, when they're high. Um, or as I mentioned, we could also uh, use a probabilistic model and we could apply regularization techniques to these kinds of models. So in summary, uh, the applying, applying unsupervised learning algorithms is not always straightforward. There are often, uh, it, it's easy to uh, either not extract the entirety of the signal or it's easy, easy to start fitting noise. And we have this problem in supervised learning too, but in unsupervised learning, it's more challenging because we have less, uh, because we don't have labeled data. And so that requires specialized, uh, specialized techniques. And in practice, this is the main consideration that you should have in mind if you're applying unsupervised learning. Are you fitting noise or are you fitting signal? And there are techniques uh, for uh, evaluating this problem, some of which I mentioned uh, just now and others we're going to see in subsequent lectures.